So I'll start tonight is the second part of the six-part lecture we're doing. I want to start by thanking Nair Tumman, as always, and Rabbi Motzen. We want to thank tonight's sponsors, as you can see over here, by uh, Dr. Elman, right, Dr. and Mrs. Elman. Um, I want to thank our tech team over here that came and set up everything early. And Shmuel Tarshish is not here yet, so I won't thank him, but I will when I see him. Okay, with that out of the way, we'll get down to work. Tonight is we're doing the uh, lecture series, which is entitled From Bubble to Barcelona and Fez to Frankfurt, The Powers of Jewish Courts Throughout the Diaspora. That's uh, Shmuel's uh, title. Tonight is the second lecture, which is entitled Jewish Courts in Christian Europe, The Age of the Rishonin. So I'm taking this forward chronologically. And here we go. <clears throat> Last night, we spoke about the Tekuvas HaGaonin, which was a period of about 400 years, which is a long time. The 600s, 700s, 800s, 900s, that kind of thing. When most Jews lived in the Muslim world, in the, in the caliphate, which and in its many provinces. So this was the Arab Empire, once upon a time. Let's see now. Here you go. Yeah, this is the Arab Empire. Look how big it was. It was gigantic. And Rove Klal Yisrael lived here. Some lived here, but most of them lived here. Okay? Nobody lived here. And Arabia was declared off limits to Jews. Okay, I did the podcast of few Jews in Yemen, but not over here. Muhammad is supposed to have said there can be only one religion in Arabia, meaning Arabia proper. As I tried to explain, the middle regions of the empire, that would be this, you know, here, the middle regions. Um, Iraq, Syria, Palestine, and Egypt. The judges were appointed by um, the Reish Galusa, the Babylonian Gaonim, the heads of the was there, possibly their juniors in Palestine. There was, as I said before, attempts to revive the patriarchate in some form or another and restore Eretz Yisrael to a central position that it once enjoyed in Jewish history, but it was unsuccessful. As a matter of fact, the Middle Ages is kind of defined as the period when Eretz Yisrael kind of like didn't count. <laughs> it's interesting. All this stuff that was happening in the major intellectual centers, Torah centers, that you've heard about, were in other places. Now, if you're a super duper, you know, expert, there were some scholars in Eretz Yisrael. These are the kind of people that were discovered in the Cairo Geniza and Louis Ginsburg and so forth. But generally speaking, the people that most of us heard about were from Babel and other places outside of Israel. But in the farther corners of the empire, things were different. So over here, the farther areas, and over here. But I mainly mean over here, the west. Look how far away it is from Baghdad and the headquarters. OK? See, so here the judges were not appointed by the Reish Galusa. Their power didn't go that far, right? They were too far away. These places were too far away for the Gaonim to control the judicial appointments. The local communities wanted to do it for themselves. The Gaons enjoyed tremendous respect, that is true, but not actual courts of power. And so the Gaonim and the yeshivas always tried to play the respect card. And for centuries, they, they, they solicited money from here, and they got a lot of money. So if you're talking about respect, support for Torah study, maintenance of the yeshivas, yes. And in return, by the way, a lot of the Shiles and Shubas that we call the Shubas Agonim are from here to here. A great number of the responsa, the letters, go to here. Okay? Um, but they didn't have courts of power. So as they say, they could play the respect card. This was the phenomenon of what we call the Shubas Agonim, the Gonic responsa, which means, as you see over here, there are many editions of them. These are Shiles and Shubas, letters that were sent by the yeshivas to communities that sent them Shilas. In the old empire, which was run pretty well, probably took a month or something to get a letter from Baghdad to Spain, or maybe a little more. And it, all things considered, it's not that long. And there was correspondence and, and intercourse between the two. And uh, these have survived um, fragmentarily in written form usually in the Cairo Guineas and those kind of places. Sometimes copies were made elsewhere. And the idea is, let's say I'm living in Spain, and we don't know what to do in Shabbos as far as the toothbrushes or something. And there's arguments in the community. Well, they'll write to the yeshiva over there. 
And they'll send back a response. And that's considered, ooh, very important. And the response is not by the head guy, but by the yeshiva as an institution. So don't think of the yeshiva in Babel, like near Israel, rather than think of yeshiva as a kind of a mini Sanhedrin. It means the senior scholars. And you can be darn sure whoever was the Rosh Hashiva, the head guy, he basically says, listen, we got a question about toothbrushes. We can argue this all we want, but I'm locking the doors. When we come out, we have a unified opinion. Get it? Everybody's backing everybody. Because they don't want to hear this. They want to hear it this way or this way. And that gave him a lot of respect and prestige, and then it's true. Um, again, if you read the famous account of, a, there's a, Famous scholar, Nosan Ababi, Nathan Babylonian, who's not the guy in the Gemara. And he's like a Jewish Marco Polo. And when he visits the, in Baghdad, the yeshivas, they had their own sessions and off sessions. They saved money by having most of the student body not be there except for two months a year. So they would assign what to read, what to learn, and so forth. And those months, you're on your own in your own little town and you study with somebody. But in Elul, and another time of the year, other whatever, they get together. This is the famous Yaki Kala. And then they have public sessions and they discuss what everybody learned. And visitors would come, and it's all a show off thing. The head guy sits like the Pasha, like the Caliph, and he's got the 70 senior scholars they call the Sanhedrin. And they all bow to each other and do all, and the guy walks away and says, Wow, I've seen something. I've seen something. You see? And this is how they try to maintain their prestige. Okay? Now, communities, as they say, send money, send them respect. But in terms of internal government, these far off communities ran their own shows. And when it came to Bayesdens, to courts, they probably imported some graduates from Surum Pumbadiso. Maybe not. So, how did somebody find a Dayan? Let's go back one. Let's go here. How did somebody get a Dayan over here to be on a Bayesden? back in the 700s, the 800s, and, all, and they did. So, you know, it could be that a guy over here needs a job, and when he graduates, we'll get a cell over here. That's possible. Or not. In addition, these Western communities, because this is the West, developed legal minhagim of their own, because they were here for hundreds of years, and they copied a lot of local institutions, Jaisha stuff, which is understandable, Moroccan norms, Spanish, Tunisian, probably, Things like the customs of local merchants, which the Gemara has also. It's called Simtusa. So there's some, I think everybody's heard this, like in the diamond business, if you shake your hands, that's equivalent to... Yeah, it's the same, it's equivalent to signing a document. Whatever the norms of those communities were. That's how they would rule. So in those, you I had an argument, if you could, let's say for argument's sake, well, give me five, you know? So if you can bring two witnesses that they did, give me five, well, then you win. You see, you know, that kind of thing. It's not Talmudic exactly, but it's not uh, other extra Talmudic. Plus, these courts, of course, developed over the course of time their local types of punishments, even if it's not exactly in the Gemara. Here we come to a basic feature of medieval Jewish jurisprudence. The Talmud, the Gemara, has all kinds of laws and rules, and it actually sets a high bar in terms of due process. I think we know, many of us, it's hard to get a conviction because, as it says, you need Adam Asra and Hatar How are you going to get a death penalty, for example, to take one example? You need two witnesses. They've got to warn the guy before he did it. The person has to then say, I don't care, I'm doing it anyway. Where are you going to get that? You see? It's, it's too high a bar for real life. Where are we going to do that? If I was the murderer or the perpetrator, I'd shoot the witnesses. <laughs> I'll take care of that. You see what I'm saying? Once you set, now, perhaps in Talmudic times, there was a very advanced form of jurisprudence, and maybe there wasn't such a breakdown of morals, and it wasn't like Baltimore City, we have killings all the time, and stuff happens once in a blue moon, all right, you can have a high bar. But in daily life, it was hard to keep this going. Remember now, let's go to the next one, confession is inadmissible in Talmudic law. It's called Ain't on a Mason Matzah Russia. So what am I doing? If you ever see the movies or you ever been involved in the law, they try to get the guy to confess. That's the whole point of putting in the police court, in the police uh, station, they grill you. Right? Isn't that what always happens in Perry Mason? You know, at the end, the guy breaks down and confesses. 
And then you got your thing. Because if the guy confesses, then it's easy for the judge to proceed. In Jewish law, a confession doesn't mean anything if you go by Talmudic law, which is interesting. That is the reason, by the way, um, that Jewish law, not that it was merciful, but was so different than Christian law and Islamic law in some degree. In the Middle Ages, let's go to the next one. This is a famous book called Los Excellencias de los Hebreos, The Excellencies of the Jews, by a uh, Murano doctor, a famous guy back in the day in the 1600s, Fernando Cardozo, Itzel Cardozo, who, there's a famous book by the professor uh, Yerushalmi Oban, and he was a secret Jew in Spain, you know, in time of the Inquisition, and he was good enough they became the, the doctor of the king of Spain, I think Philip III. And that means, you know, he was up there, he had the Rolodex. But he couldn't stand living a double life. And in the end, he ran away one day, didn't come to work, and he fled Spain, he went to Italy. He ended up in a small Jewish community in Verona in northern Italy, as living in a, in a little ghetto. And he was the MD of that ghetto. So basically, it's like Hertzberg's has somebody from Harvard you know, Medical School. And that's what he wanted to do. He wanted to live as a Jew. And being that he was Jewish, he knew that the Spanish have all these books called Los Excellencias de los Españoles, the superiority of the Spanish. So he wrote a book, The Superiority of the Hebrews. And one of the points, it's a very interesting book. It's in Hebrew, I have it in Hebrew. Um, uh, something Hayyudim, Ma'alot Hayyudim. And, but he wrote in Spanish. And one of the things he says is like this. You talk about the Judaism being inferior. We are the only law system around today that doesn't use torture. Because the whole point of torture is to elicit a confession. And there's no point. So if you were arrested by the Inquisition, they want you to confess. Oh my goodness. <laughs> oh boy. You know, they really start going at you with all those instruments. And in the other areas. And their whole idea was, like the Rambam says, really the Eighth Toe wants to confess. The Eighth is preventing you. So, therefore, we're going to beat the heck out of you or burn you with iron or something like that to get you to confess. Um, in Jewish law, it doesn't work. So that's all very nice for a lecture. But in real reality, if you're running a community, you have perpetrators, you kind of do want a confession. You see what I'm saying? And second of all, as they say, Nikorn de Ramis. If I think that he's the perpetrator over here, and we corner him, we show him the evidence, that he breaks down and says, I did it, you can tell it's true. So what did they do? Um, in addition, many of the punishments were not applicable in the absence of smuchim. We have to have people with the old smuchim from way back when, which doesn't exist anymore. So that means, to use American terminology, if you, if you didn't have somebody who was a sworn-in judge, you can't run a case. So imagine if in Baltimore, that might not be a good example. Imagine if in a normal city, there's no judge, call, a, you know, a sworn judge. What do you do? I mean, what do you do? You see? Now, um, I mean, if you follow Talmudic law, which is God's law, what do you do if you have a serial co co killer in the from community or a serial molester? Do you do nothing? Because if we don't have a smuchim, we can't administer the laws. I'm trying to show you that when the Middle Ages hit, they're very blatant that the ideal, on the one hand, is, is running into life reality on the other hand. You can't simply say, well, that's what the Torah says. How dare you criticize it? I got a killer over here. <laughs> can't do that. Believe me, it doesn't take long for bad guys to learn the ropes and the loopholes and operate within them. And so once the Russia learns the Talmudic law, uh, I don't have to punch, I'll get my wife to punch you. She is not subject to uh, arrest or anything. I'll get, her, I'll get my kids to break your windows. They can do it. You understand? They can do it. I know a case in Baltimore where somebody did that. So, what are you going to do? Is, is it, are you going to allow that? You see, so can you go around and damage my property, taking advantage of the loopholes that lie within the Talmudic law? Um, or let's go to the next one. Grama. If you know some of the... No, the one before that. I guess he skipped it. I didn't notice Anyway, uh, grumma means if you cause something indirectly. So basically, I don't want to give you any ideas, but if I don't like Bill, and I want to blow him up, 
I just put a bomb in his car with a time fuse for half hour or more, and then it's not actionable under Talmudic law because there was a time gap between the time I did it and the time the thing went off, which makes no sense. You see? So, so, they use that now for uh, electric uh, scooters for Shabbos. <laughs> yeah, but there's a difference between that. Yeah, when, bomb, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know? So the thing is, or the, a time gap or a space gap, so you have all these Talmudic rules, and they say, I guess, oh, you're Chayyab Adini Shemayim. The killer doesn't care about that. So how do you run a society which, on the one hand, says it's committed to the Torah, and the Torah, as they understand it, is the Talmud. The Talmud has all these rules which don't work. What do you do? Okay? Um, as we all know, we still have problems down till today with this Aguna stuff and the marriage and divorce extortion uh, uh, phenomenon, which was the result of the Talmudic laws. As I said the other day, it's too easy to get married, it's too hard to get divorced. And nobody has a solution for it around till today. These and many other situations were part of real life, and it was impossible. I mean, you couldn't expect the Jewish public to simply piously suffer a molester, a malshin, some old gigolo, a white slaver, or whatever. But under the letter, Talmudic law and economy. And so you had a clash between the Torah, the Talmudic law on the one hand, and real life. How is this to be solved? It turns out that this clash was nothing new. You had such problems in biblical times as well as Talmudic times. And it turns out that the Torah itself provides, as it had to, what were called the Horosha, which is special rulings. Notice he suspend the law. There are many examples of this in the Bible. Let's take a look, for example, at the golden calf, a famous thing that the uh, Lomdim like to look at. How come Moshe Rabbeinu tell everybody to go and kill people for the golden calf? You want to get technical on me? Were you warned not to make a golden calf? Were there two witnesses? Did you then say, eh? There was, no, there was no trial whatsoever. He just said, everybody get a sword and kill everybody's next to you. Okay? So that's like one of the early examples of Rosh Hashanah. Here's another famous case. And King David, if you remember the story, the Amalekite comes from the battlefield and says, I killed Saul. And here's Saul's, because the Philistines were about to wipe him out, so I finished him off. And, uh, and I did it to help you, David. And so here is the crown of Saul and his, and his arm bracelet. Here's another version of the same. See? And David kills him. He said, you touch the anointed of the Lord, kill him, and kill him right away. How do you do that? Where's the trial? Where's the due process? Where's the procedure? Oh, it's a horror show. You see? Here's another one, very famous. The prophet Elijah at Mount Carmel. Remember, he, he goes against the 400 priests at the Baal. And he says, you bring down a fire. And they carry it all day, they can't do nothing. He says, watch this, poof, and the fire comes down. If you want to get technical on me, you're not allowed to have a carbon outside the base of Middash. And you're not going to say, Elia, no, he's a sinner. So the answer is, you see, already in biblical times, the way the Talmudic rabbis viewed it, there were special circumstances. And under special circumstances, you can, so to speak, do away with the law, work around the law, <coughs> violate the law, not as a norm, but it's a special case, okay? And there are more. In the Talmud itself, there are a fair number of cases involving what we call Hora Shab, which is a temporary ruling in a special case, usually in the context of some pressing external reality, often historical. Here's a very famous case. Uh, My, some of you will know this because you do the Dafiyami. There was a guy who rode in a horse on Shabbos, in time of the Greeks, not the times of the Maccabee and the uh, Greek suppression of the Jewish religion. Okay? And the Jewish guy rode a horse, Asayin Shabbos, and they brought him to Basin and they stoned him. Now, wait a minute. Riding a horse on Shabbos, I'm not advocating it, it's not one of the 30 Amalekas. Aside from the fact, no, it's not a death penalty situation. Aside from the fact, as I said before, there was no due process. Nobody warned them and all the rest of it. Fial Bishava Rak al Rabbanan. So at the most, he did this to Rabbanan because you can't ride a horse because you're afraid you'll break off a branch or something like that. Ro Bezin Shashot Srikhalakach. The Bezin at that time ascertained that this is the need of the hour. They were in a war for Judaism against the Greek suppression. It was an emergency situation. Many Shalyam put some virus. And people were being very um, non observant. 
They want to hammer home a point. So what is that? That's not legal. You see? That's what you call policy. That's introducing politics. Yeah, that's right. So you can pr introduce what we would call today political considerations into something even involving a death penalty. Now, not political considerations like you and me and Trump. We're talking about a basin, but nevertheless, they did it. Here's another famous case that you probably have heard of. Uh, it's a story Oops. with Shimbun Shetach that he hanged 80 witches in the one day uh, in Ashkelon. They came back and got his son. You know, they took revenge on him, the relatives. Even though there was no warning and there was no inquiry, again, there was no due process. It's not like there were lawyers and each witch was hauled up and they had a case. They went through all that stuff. There was no Drisha Chakira and there wasn't even a clear witnesses. But nevertheless, he did it because the hour needed it. Meaning, Shem Ben Shetak lived in time with the Pharisees and the Sadducees. There was a witchcraft cult growing uh, big time. He said, we're going to nip this in the bud. He did it in the Middle Eastern way. And he broke the law. He was a head of son Henry. He said, well, this is a special case. Matter of fact, you're not allowed to tr try more than one capital case in a day. It's a very famous you know, exception to the rule. You're not allowed to have more than one capital case in a day. He did 80 in one day. So I'm simply saying... The Talmud itself, which is, on the one hand, very legalistic and very insistent on due process and that sort of thing, does admit of quote-unquote special situations, emergency situations, like in a wartime or something like that. Uh, we have other cases of public indecency. There was a guy, they, they killed him, or they whipped him. There was a guy who did it with his wife in public under a tree, you know, like in a, in a park. Today... <laughs> We call it Central Park. <laughs> you know, it's, it's Europe. <laughs> right? And they gave him Malchus. They gave him lashes. Not because, now, wait a minute. What exactly did he do wrong from the halachic point of view? They were married. Okay? So you, you get what I'm saying? On the other hand, heck with that. <laughs> we're not going to allow this breakdown of public indecency. Not because it was Roy Lecoq, meaning he didn't if you want to get technical on me, legal, he didn't actually do anything illegal, but because it doesn't say anywhere in the Bible, thou shalt not do this in a public part, but the t hour needed, so therefore, make it to set up a fence. Meaning, we're not going to allow a breakdown of public decency. So, again, you see that ordinarily the courts administer it according to regular law, but some unusual special case, they did not hesitate, as we would say in English, take the law in your own hands. That's yeah. Now, that's not, actually not a good case. That's Kanoim Pogimbo. That's different. In other words, what we have over here is what we call in the United States of America martial law. Okay? Where narrowly we have constitutional rights and all that kind of stuff. Let's say there's a breakdown of law and order. Now, today in modern America, because of the politics, they don't do this. They just let Chicago burn like, uh, you know, a couple years ago. And they let them break into the, all the stores in L.A. But if you went back 50 or 100 years ago, if there was a breakdown in public order, they would bring in the army and shoot people. Uh, Abraham Lincoln sent the federal army into New York City in 1863. Yeah, they, but they didn't use violence. I'm saying the 20, see, they chose, they chose not to. This is LBJ. I was there. You were there. They chose not to. But I'm um, going back, as I said before, in the um, in Civil War, when the Irish rioted, and started killing black people and all kind of other stuff. They went crazy over the draft riots. And it was, they were burning down Manhattan. And Lincoln sent an army and they just shot everybody. Now, when law and order was restored, then you went back to constitutional rights. It's nothing but an example of what we're taught martial law. So the Bayesian, you see, is not always bound by the letter of Talmudic law. If the court and the community, known as the board of directors, feels it's a special situation. This was the mindset throughout the Middle Ages of Kehillahs, wherever the Jews live. It was here when everything's normal, we go by normal law. If some unusual special situation pops up, we don't, okay? The cases I have just cited were cases involving threats to societal norms, to tzniyas, ritual laxity, disrespect, etc. But there were other causes, other cases, 
in which they perceived a physical threat, a threat to the physical survival of a particular uh, Jewish community or set of communities. First of all, Mesira, the Moser. Okay? That's the person who tells on tells the, the Goyim what's going on in the Jewish community. Tells on them. Which we always had all the time throughout Jewish history, and we still do today. The Moser, of course, could tell on the Jew, which was bad enough. Or he can tell on the whole Jewish community, if so, and get them all killed. Just to give you one example, last week or two weeks ago, we had the anniversary of Nicol Nicholas Donan, who's informing against the Gemara. He converted, he went to the Catholic Church and said, what, the Talmud is all against Jesus, burn them all. And in 1242, they burned all the Hebrew books in France, which put French Judaism out of business. The Tosas went <clears throat> like that, you know, because no books, you can't do anything. It's before the internet. All because of one guy who told on them. That's all. Um, so you see that the power of a tattletale, and that's not the right word, it's re the technical word in English is a delation, a delator, right? And that's if you inform it like, like in a criminal way. So the Moser wasn't just a sinner, a regular criminal. He was a political threat. I mean, he could get everybody killed or imprisoned or who knows what. And in all systems of law, even the most legalistic systems of law, life-threatening political crimes are always treated more harshly and with less concern for due process, including the USA under President Obama. After all, Obama killed Osama. Where was their trial? Where's the due process? He wasn't arrested. Why didn't they pick him up and fly him back to America and give a trial? They didn't do that. They took him out. And moreover, you remember and I remember, Obama, who's a liberal, was sending rockets to bomb people, rockets, you know, all over the Middle East. Include, now I don't, I back them on that. They were bad guys, they're out to get us. But some of the people that were killed were U.S. citizens who joined the jihadists. Do you remember that? So, wait a minute, I'm already getting into constitutional issues. Because here I am, President of the United States, I find that this guy was born, let's say, in Indiana, a Christian who's now flipped and joined the Al Qaeda types, and now he's hiding out in Yemen <clears throat> or one of those type of places. He's plotting to do something to American embassy, and we know where he is, you know, like in the movies with those spy cameras. And we can send a bomb to blow up his car, you know, a rocket. And Obama said, "Yeah, well, let's do it," a bunch of times. And you did not see the United States Supreme Court make a boo. It's interesting. You see. He had a consensus of the broad American public. Right? Now, by the way, I'm sure there were some professors here and there that said, who, boo, boo. But the political system, the Congress, the Supreme Court, nobody said it because they said it's a political thing. You know what I'm saying? Guantanamo, to use a word that triggers all these things. That's they say, wartime. what's that? That's war. That's not. There's, you're wrong. The United States never declared war on anybody. War is a legal uh, concept. See my point? That's my point. Right? War is a legal concept. As the President of the United States, they have what you call War Powers Act. He would have to go to, if you want to get technical with me, you've got to go to Congress and say, there's such and such a threat in Yemen, and we feel it's a political threat, and Congress under War Powers Act should authorize the necessary use of force, and so on and so on and such and so on. They didn't do any of that. You see? So, uh, I'm simply saying societies will generally react in self-defense, when it's perceived to their, to their life, even disregarding the normal rules of due process. Although Jewish courts in the Middle Ages did try to follow some kind of due process when it came to Mosrim, so if it were possible, there would be a court. They would take witnesses, if it's possible. Let's say they'll round this guy up, they'll bring him to court, two guys holding him down, and these two guys or whoever will come and say, he did this and this and that and that. And the Moser would have a chance to refute the charges. They'd have, you know, a cross-examination. And when it's all over, they issue a verdict. That usually was not possible. I mean, you could, you could have that. It could happen once in a while. But usually, as you can understand yourself, that's not possible. Okay? Usually, this wasn't possible. You usually had to surprise the guy when he wasn't expecting it. More like the Mossad style. To use plain English... Bayesian in the Middle Ages bumped off 
or executed if the state allowed, most of them in similar types. I said if the state allowed, meaning if the Gaisha state, as we shall see, maybe next week. But if they got permission from the Gentile authorities, they could bump off the guy. And sometimes even if they didn't get permission from Gentile authorities, but then you're treading on thin ice. You see? Same thing throughout Jewish history was done not only for the Moser, but for the counterfeiter. Because he could get the whole Jewish community killed. You understand? Some guy who's an individual who's such a, a flagrant thing is counterfeiting the king's money and causing, imagine the destruction it does to the economy. I say, a Jew did it. They're not going to be nice enough to say, well, one Jew did it, and the others are blaming us. They're going to kill everybody. You see? So the Jewish community, it's in the Shulchan, would say like this, if you got a guy like that, we'll kill him because he's a walking threat. So we always have in the Jewish community, down to today in Baltimore, people who are completely responsible, do things, it doesn't matter if it hurts anybody else in the community or whatever, they ask no questions, they do whatever heck they want, and they you know, can go and just wreck everything. You see? I can think of a lot of cases, but I won't say them. And you can too. And um, once upon a time, what's your, re what, what's your recourse? So they would say, this person is just an impossible person in our community. And we've got to get rid of them one way or another. Now, on the other hand, the victim might have powerful friends or powerful family network. And then things got dicey. After all, suppose you have a fairly small Jewish community of 50 families, which was common in Ashkenaz, as we shall see. Or 100 families, not a lot. And one of them is a Moser, but his name is, let's say, Friedman. And he's got a lot of relatives in the town. And you kill him or whatever, their family's going to go after you. Then it becomes really political. So the idea that Basin operates in a completely uh, sterile, antiseptic, ivory tower, and all the rest of it, simply adjudicating based on the application of abstract principles is baloney. Life exists in the, in the living, and the law exists in life. And a lot of things have to be taken into account. And that's just the way it goes. Because the Jews didn't have a government and army like we have. Okay? I mean, it happens often. They kill a Moser. Then his relatives say, okay, then we're going to tell on you. What if it's 20 people? You can't kill 20 people out of a community of 100 families. So what do you do? So they have to give a lot of thought. And probably, very often, they simply suffered. And this is real life that went on century after century in the Jewish communities as part of the Gaulists. Okay? Now, when things were good, though, and the Jews did have autonomy, Boy, oh boy, then they killed the people right and left. A very famous story. Look at this. And <laughs> Lucino was the Lakewood of Spain. That's where you had the big yeshiva, originally in Cordoba and then in Lucina, that was set up by Shmuel Nugget. And eventually the Rosh Yeshiva there was the Rif, the Rimigash. That was the Lakewood of Spain. And it was an all Jewish town. It had a castle and a moat around it. The Jews lived in a fortified situation. And Shaman and Shesikl, Rabbi Yosef Alevi Mimigash, the Rimigash, had stoned a Moser in Lucina on Yom Kippur on a Saturday at Neela time. Right? You know, when you walked out of that show, you didn't say, like, so how was services? <laughs> you know, who, who died for the army? <laughs> you get it? Now, why did he do that? Right? They want to make a point. Because aside from all the other issues, aside from everything else, on Yom Kippur, he couldn't wait. And on a Shabbos, Yom Kippur, and by Neila, he want to make a point. See, so to speak, violating Jewish law, right? He's violating normal Jewish law as a Horoshah to hammer home the point to strike terror, he obviously hoped, and other potential Muslim. Right? Now, was he a good at today? They say, wait till after Yom Kippur. <laughs> Things like that. Uh, and it's a Rimigash. Now, by the way, he was a student of the Rif. If you know anything about the Rif, the Rif had been a big rabbi in North Africa, a big rabbi, but then he had to get out of there because most of them almost got him killed. He escaped with his life. You see? So this is the harsh reality of once upon a time. 
Now, um, so a consensus emerged among the various separate Kehillahs in the Middle Ages. Across the Jewish world, the killing Mosrim was permitted even in the absence of smuchin, even though technically speaking, you're not allowed to give a death penalty. But this one, they said, this is a special case. Um, and even the absence of due process, which of course leads to pitfalls. Due process means, how do you know you got the right guy? Okay. We all know what, the whole purpose of developing due process <coughs> is to avoid as much as humanly possible <coughs> the conviction of an innocent man. Right? The conviction of an innocent man. And the famous theory is you'd rather let a whole bunch of guilty people go off and not hurt an innocent man. Unless you hold like Stalin, I'd rather kill 100 people as long as one of them's guilty. <laughs> you know? But in a normal society, you're trying to make sure and very sure, and we've all read move, uh, books and seen movies, you know, 12 Angry Men and all that. In the beginning, they're sure the guy's guilty, and by the time they do investigate, he wasn't guilty. But they didn't have this luxury with the Moser or the counterfeiters. And therefore, they say, if, the, if people say this guy did it, and it's just like we all know it, so they're, they're going to take him down. Okay? Now, consensus is the key word here. Because consensus was the only glue that kept the Jews around the world together. They couldn't keep basically on the same page. Because remember, we're dealing with the Middle Ages, in which there were no national Jewish institutions. There were no international Jewish organizations. There never was even an attempt, all during these many centuries, for the Jews ever to get together, have some kind of representative group, discuss the needs of Kali Yisrael. I mean, they could have done it if you want to get very technical with me, theoretically possible, they wouldn't even try it. You see? Such a concept didn't exist until Herzl, which is very late. Such consensus, therefore, could only be informal. It had to be that all the communities, like I say, agree with this. We all have the same general attitude towards the Moser, or against the counterfeiter, or against this or that and the other. And when you had a consensus, you did, and when you did not have a consensus, you did not. Okay. Have you ever been in a group or a club in which they don't go by majority rule, but they want a consensus? It's difficult, you see? And so you move when you can, and otherwise you don't. Now, such consensus can only be informal, because as I said before, there were no Jewish gatherings. There was no pollings or questionnaires sent out. There was no registering of opinion. How would they do that? No, the consensus had to be informal, and it was a consensus of elites. Who are the elites involved in the kind of issues I'm talking about tonight? Well, your, your rabbis and scholars, they're supposed to be the experts in the law, the judges on the courts, the one in Paris, the one in Rome, the one in, in, in Spain, the one in North Africa, the one in these are the elites, and the lay leaders like the boards of directors, you know, the Shiva Tuvi, as they call them, the machers, okay, the machers. So if you got in one area or across the Jewish people, or maybe among the Spartan, <clears throat> not the Ashkenazim or the other way around, we have a consensus that this is what we should all do, they would do it. Nothing particularly formal. Um, okay. It was within these groups and among these groups, sometimes with regional variations, that such consensus has emerged. So if you take a look, we're talking about Jews in the Arab world, Jews in the Byzantine Empire world, Jews in the Christian Catholic world. So they might have their consensus, which is different than this. They might have their consensus, which is different than that. Alternatively, they might all agree to actual practice on the same consensus, like killing a Mosa. That might spread along here. It might be different. You could have variations. You see? You say, well, it's all Talmudic law. It ain't so simple as that, so I'm trying to get across. It's not so simple. Such consensus is revolved around several interesting questions. The first question is, what is the halacha? That's not so simple. Right? What is the halacha? What exactly is the Talmudic law in different situations? I think many people are aware that the Gemara is the opposite of simple, and it's the opposite of clear to see what the ruling is from the discussion, especially when you talk about a broad sugya. As we all know, the Gemara is not crystal clear. The sugya which is where they discuss it, can contain contradictory rulings or may imply such. What is the final halach in all this? It's quite possible and not infrequent that different scholars, including the biggies, 
reach different conclusions as to the final halacha. This is what you and I call a machlokas rishonim. And the yeshivas today study like an ivory tower exercise. It's a, it's just a theoretical, it's, you know, it's, it's not in the real. So you say, oh, it's a machlokas between Rashi and Tosis, how to read that Gemara. And maybe you have a bechina or something like that. All right. But you realize it may be a sugya in which the argument between Rashi and Tosis might mean, according to Rashi, she's married, according to Tosis, she's not married. According to Rashi, this guy gets killed, according to Tosis, it doesn't get killed. And those are important differences. So in the Middle Ages, when you had something what we call machlokas rishonim, difference of scholars, it had practical consequences because the courts were administering Talmudic law. And as I said before, who the heck knows what Talmudic law is in many, many cases. Sometimes it's clear. But very often it's not. Okay? Um, I mean, there was and could not be universal consensus as to what governs, in, especially in the early Middle Ages. The Silgi de Shmaitse or something else. You have this phenomenon where a topic is discussed in one place and it reappears here and there elsewhere in the Talmud. So which is the governing one? Which should he go by? Because according to this, it sounds like it's kosher. In the other place, it sounds like it's treif. In the other place, it sounds like tutti frutti. In the other place, it sounds like that. How do you operate? We all say we're all in favor of the Gemara. What does the Gemara mean? And so in some places, early Middle Ages especially, they say you go by the main one. If it's discussed in great detail in one place and only lesser detail elsewhere, it's called the Sugi de Shmaisa. And whatever the ruling over there, if it says the animal's kosher, that's it. And don't worry about these other places. But other Rishonim later on didn't like that. And they said, what are you talking about? You can't ignore the other places. I'm simply trying to show you. It's not so simple. Let's go to the next one. Uh, a lot of times you'll find, here's a classic. A lot of times you'll find a Gemara in which they never tell you what the final ruling is. But there's A and B. Let's say, for example, Rav versus Shmuel. And Rav says it's kosher and Shmuel says it's treif. All of a sudden, the Gemara starts saying, Rav, how can you say it's kosher? What about this and this and this? And he gives some kind of answer. What about that and that and that? He gives some kind of answer. What about that and that? He gives some kind of answer. And usually, they're not great answers. So what do I take from that? It's possible to say, since his answers were not good, that's not how we follow the halacha. They don't, they don't make it, they're shinui dechiki. They're dochik, they don't make any sense. Alternatively, you could adopt a tradition that says, well, why are they asking Rav and not about Shmuel? Must be, he's the one that they're interested in. That must be the opinion we follow. Who knows? I'll say it again. If this is a theoretical question, I'm just giving an entertaining lecture. If your property's on the line, if your life is on the line, if your marriage is on the line, <laughs> I want some better, you know, something better than that, okay? I mean, I lost $50,000 because you felt she knew the Chiklo Samchina and something like that. These are the complexities of Lumdus, and in different regions of the world, different consensus has emerged. And you and I know from hindsight, the most important of these consensus is regarded the meaning of the Talmudic Sogis, and they were developed far away from Iraq and Dagonin, far away from Surin Pompadisa. So maybe the original um, headquarters of the Talmudic study was back in Babylonia, but it really developed in terms of theoretical sophistication, textually, in places very far away from Babylon, so in Spain, in France, in North Africa, in Italy, in places like that. Okay? I mean, consensus is that developed that would have long-term influences on halachi practice down to our own days. So let us turn to these communities. Okay? These far-off communities that I'm talking about developed in their own ways, and for our purposes tonight, because time is always a factor, we'll look at the two biggies, even though there were more. The two biggies would be, let's go to the next one, Ashkenaz and Sephard. Here is Spain, Sephard. Uh, basically, Spain used to be part of the Roman Empire. The Arabs captured it. Look what they did, 99%. But it was like a tumor. The, the Arabs made a big mistake. They, this all they conquered from the Christians, but this part stayed Christian. Big mistake. Because then, little by little, over 800 years, the Christians got it back. Look, for example, in there, and then look over here. Look how, they, look how it grew. You see? The Christian part. And then by this time, look how it grew even more. The Arabs made a big mistake. Okay? Nevertheless, 
for a while, he ruled the vast majority of what you and I call Spain, Iberia, Spain, and Portugal, they call Andalusia. Okay? Now, uh, very briefly, when the Muslims conquered Spain, it's a very rich country. Some of you were in my trip. I can't remember. Um, what I mean is agriculture. It's a beautiful country. Everywhere is growing the olives and the orange. It's, it's very fertile. You get it? And they also have rivers and mines and who knows what. It's quite a place. They even have deserts. It's quite a peninsula. So when the Muslims took it over, they said, this is a bonanza. We've got to develop this. But the vast majority of the population was Christian. Some converted, some did not. There was a very large Christian minority in Spain and made the Muslims feel pretty uncomfortable. So one of the things the Muslims did was they had no problem with Jews moving in. In fact, they encouraged that. Because all the Jews moving in are non-Christians. You see? The Christians used to torture the Jews before the Arabs showed up. So it's in the Jewish interest to back the Arabs. So they are not a problem. Consequently, there was a mass immigration in the 700s and 800s into Spain from all kinds of places. Jewish immigration. Even from Eretz Israel, from all kinds of places, because of a good economy. Like the US people moved there 100 years ago. It was a good economy. And the Arabs are not going to bother you because you're not the ones they're worried about. The Jews are no political threat whatsoever. And that's how the Sephardim became the largest Jewish community in the Middle Ages. In Spain or Andalusia, you had a much larger Jewish population than anywhere else. Okay? Much larger than anywhere else. Um, the large population meant you had large Jewish communities. You have communities of several thousand people, which in the Middle Ages was very large. And that gave the kahilos that formed in Spain a kind of a certain formal institutional character. And the Bote Din were among the most powerful in the Jewish world. Because there things were very institutionalized. We had a basin in Cordoba or someplace like that, you know, Toledo. It's a court with procedures and bailiffs and uh, recorders and jails and all that stuff, you see? Um, as we shall see, they followed the Talmudic law, except when they didn't. So the Rambam, for example, says, the Rambam, who was from Spain, had to flee when he was young, but he grew up in the Spanish tradition. He says, it's, it's very common, in the Maghreb, in, in Spain and Morocco. La haroga mostrim limsar If they find somebody who's a moser, who's, get, who's causing Jews to lose money, handing over to the guy, they bump him off. So basically, what they did in Spain was, the Jewish court would condemn the guy, and the Arab uh, execution would kill him. Or they would condemn him to be uh, whipped, and the Arab guy did it. Notice that they had the institutions of the state were at their disposal. You see? And, that's, and the Rambam says, it's my simple Cholzman. Not very common. So the Spanish courts were powerful. And the reason is, the key is those rich, powerful Jews who had big influence at the court, the Chazdeb and Shabrut types. Okay? You had these court Jews who used their influence to secure great powers for the Jewish courts. Here's from Beit HaTzvusah. There's the Caliph, Abderman III, the big guy in Spain. And here's the Jew, um, Chazdeb and Shabrut. And what's he doing? He's introducing these Christian ambassadors to the caliph. He, the Jew, can speak Arabic. He can also speak the Christian languages. He's a go-between. And he was a physician, very famous uh, expert in pharmacology of that time. And he stood high with the uh, king. And as a result, the king would say like this, okay, and what can I do for you? Give the Jewish courts the power to beat the heck out of the Jews they don't like, something like that. And the king would say, all right, well, God. Go ahead. You see? And throughout the history of the Jews in Spain, we had these powerful court Jew types that each one in his own way got in with the rulers. And they did use, and they were always the leaders of their communities because they're rich. Therefore, when they asked for increased powers for the Kehla, they're talking for themselves. And the courts, the Basin is an arm of the Kehla. And therefore, they had a strong 
uh, power. Okay? Uh, as I said before, Chazdai was the king's physician, which is very important. By the way, a physician in that time would have meant personal life trainer. You know, he's your diet expert and all this kind of stuff. Do you remember I told you once he cured the fat king? I did this talk somewhere. There was a king in northern Spain. There was a prince. He wanted to be king called Sancho the Fat. And due to the screwball politics of the Arabs, and all that, he was actually a relative of the caliph. Oh, he's a Christian. And his mother wanted him you know, to become the king. But he was so fat, it was a Rodney Dangerfield problem. He you know, couldn't get no respect. And what did he do? And the caliph said, bring him down here. I'll put him in the hands of my Jew. And he sewed his mouth up, except a little bit. And then he could only do a saw. He had a whole regimen. had a whole regimen. And he taught the guy, because the guy was like 700 pounds, you know. And he slimmed him down in a year. People were astonished. He actually said, you know, do such a thing as three meals a day, not 30, <laughs> you know. And then the guy was slimmed down. He could come back and get respect. Became king. I'm just trying to show you that he was like a Henry Kissinger, a foreign policy expert, not only just being a doctor. So one of the benefits he's going to get is like this, give me the power over the Jews. He said, all right, what, what do I care? You, know, you see? And he was an Orthodox Jew, so he would, you know, back the basins. And he actually ransomed that guy who was one of the four captives, uh, Moshe Mechanoch, and he sent him up in a big yeshiva, and he turned Spain into big Malcolm Torah in Cordoba. So the point is that these guys had power. Uh, this enabled them to persecute the Karaites. Spain is famous and notorious, but depending on your point of view, where the Rabbinites had all the power, and they beat the heck and they tortured all the Karaites because they held them to be heretics, you see? Um, I mean, let's put it this way. Remember Shmuel HaNagid, who eventually rose to be the prime minister in the kingdom of Granada in the 11th century? And he, was, he was the prime minister, the commander in chief of the army, and a big rabbi. So tell me what the basin was like in Granada in his time. They're like all powerful. So you listened to the community rules? It was hell to pay. And I repeat, the Jews are never a political threat to the Arabs, to Muslims. So that's why they don't mind giving the local Jewish community power. You know, like I say, they're not the, the Christians are the problem. This tradition lasted throughout the Muslim period until the time of the Rambam when the Almohads took over. They were like the Taliban, and they turned 180 degrees and said Judaism is prohibited. So then that, everything changed. The whole world collapsed overnight. But until the middle 1100s, the 700s, the 800s, the 900s, the 1000s and into the early 1100s, you had powerful courts and powerful kehillas in the Spanish Peninsula. That's why the Sephardim have even now a tradition, mishmas, you know, this big respect, you see, you know. Now, thanks to Moshe ben Chanuch, as I said before, Spain became a big Mokham Torah. They really set up a Lakewood, first in Cordoba and then Lucina, and they could supply all the judges you need and then some. So after the 900s, 1000s, 1100s, like the time of the Rambam, I mean, where did Rambam's father learn? In Lucina. Where did his father learn? In Lucina. <laughs> you see? Um, and so they had plenty of big Talmudic Chachamim. They didn't have rabbis. They had communities with boards of directors and Dianim to run the courts. And it was a strong situation. Now, the judges were big Talmudic Chacham with the experts of a Suki Shmites and Levite Hilgasa. Which means, if this is the type of yeshiva that you're turning out graduates who are going to be dayanim, when you learn the Gemara, the emphasis is going to be on what's the halach at the end. Not like they do in yeshiva today, it's a different system. And so the courts had a high level of competence in adjudicating Talmudic law, combined with the new modifications that I talked about, introduced by the Gaonim already in a couple centuries earlier, and whatever modifications they introduced in Spain themselves. Okay? This was the class, the class of people, the family background of Moses Maimonides. Okay, when you're looking at the Rambam, you're looking at, look how he writes about himself. Ani Moshe, uh, where is it here? 
Look what he describes himself. Ani Moshe ben Maimon Hadayin, ben Yosef Hachacham, ben Yosef Hadayin, ben Yosef Hadayin, ben Yosef Hadayin, ben Shlomo Rav, ben Yosef Hadayin, Zecha Lebracha. He came, you know, not from a poor background or anything like this. He came from the highest class of the Spanish Jewish rabbinic intellectualist aristocracy. They get a long line of Dianine. Which is why the Rambam was uh, this big posse. You know what I'm saying? He didn't have, he picked this up at home. You know, when he's a kid, what kind of house was he into? When he came to take his father home for lunch. It's a court. You understand what I'm saying? He just knew this by osmosis, aside from the fact he was a genius. I'm just trying to show you, he's not some kid like, comes in there, Israel from you know, upstate New York. They had a family that didn't even kosher. And then he turns out to be a big lambda in near Israel. That's good too. I'm talking about something different. Right? Somebody came from a long line of the Spanish court system, which was highly developed and highly, uh, what's the right, stratified. So what you get in the Mishnah Torah when the Ramam writes the law code is the ripe product of the Spanish Jewish juridical tradition. It's not simply the Rambam had to go through shots. He did that. He goes through shots. He knew a lot of this beforehand. Right? Now, I'm not saying he knew Hilchus Garbanus, but when it comes to Shabbos, the Kashras, real life, everyday things, he just knew it because he lived it, you see? So, um, as a result, you can imagine Dini Mominus, financial matters, were pretty well developed in Spain, and a lot of what we call Choshen Mishpah comes from Spain. In fact, the very term Chosha Mishpah originates with a book called The Tour. Chosha Mishpah is the, is the financial laws. The partial is a, a, and that's originally in The Tour, which was written in Toledo in Spain. Okay? And most of what we call Chosha Mishpah is a knockoff from a book called Sefer Atrumos, from the Talmud of the Ramban, Shmuel Sardi, who was a businessman in Talmud Chacham, and was very interested in all these you know, financial matters, contracts, Rules in the States, property, and all that other kind of business they teach in law school. To summarize, the courts in Spain, especially during the Andalusian period, when the times were good under the Arabs, were among the most powerful in Jewry. Now, mind you, despite their expertise in Talmudic law, they did not feel bound by its limitations any more than the other courts I described until now. They gave credence to circumstantial evidence when they wished to. They punished adultery even the absence of Adam Hasra and all the rest of it, when they felt that the communities were lapsing in different areas, they imposed strict penalties because the Muslims do this too. It's a society where they demand strict adherence to religious law. That's one group. The other group, we started in the first half of Middle Ages, the other important area for Jewish culture, particularly Jewish legal culture, was Ashkenaz. Here we're talking about a different area, right? Until now, I talked about Spain. Now I'm talking about here. Ashkenaz is this part of the Holy Roman Empire and the Kingdom of France. Rashi and Tosos live here in France, which was smaller than it is today. This part is now part of France today. It wasn't then. But that whole area was Ashkenaz and very strong. The, our, our traditions come from there. Nobody knows exactly how those Jews got there, but in the earlier Middle Ages, as I think we know, these Jews became the big Tamini Chachamim, the experts in the Gemara. The Benu Gershom, Rashi, Tosa, those kind of people. But they lived in conditions very different than the Sephardim in many ways. They lived under Christians, not Muslims. That means they lived under charters. You see, in the Arab world, the Jews had always been there. When the Muslims took over the empire, they were there. And the Arab law simply said, as long as they, you know, do certain marks of inferiority, um, they can just continue to exist. Remember, they weren't a threat. But to get into France in the first place, there were no Jews there. How did you get into France altogether? Or into the Holy Roman Empire? How does that work? And if it worked, and whenever it worked, they had to kiss up to the local lord. They had to write out a deal with him, which is called royal charters. And it says, we're going to have 10 families named Kaplan move into this and this community. They are going to, this is what I'm saying, they're going to come up with uh, three quarters of a million dollars in taxes every year, 10 families, in cash and gold coins. They'll be doing January 1. 
In return for that, they can practice their business and we will give them police protection. In return for that, they can have a synagogue or something small, nothing big. Don't take off the others. They can have a little cemetery. No, just keep your you know, presence down and you can practice your religion. Now this contract runs for five years or 10 years or whatever, then it has to be renewed later. And that is how life was lived. And sometimes when the 10 years are up, the guy might say, yes, okay, I'm, I'm exercising my option and get the heck out of here. That's called being expelled from a region. These kind of things happen all the time. If you're Jewish and you're smart, you're not gonna buy very heavy furniture in your house because you, know, you might have to move. You see, this is life. Now, he lived under Christians, not Muslims, under charters. They were scattered in tiny communities all over the place that are no large kehilos. That's a very important difference between Ashkenaz and Sephardim. If you have very small communities, what's a court? I mean, if the people here now constitute the entire community of a, of a village or a town, what's a basin? It's ridiculous. We all know each other. We're too small. Can't have all this formality. It's like a New England town meeting. You see what I'm saying? Um, a typical French Jewish community, in the time I'm talking about, not much bigger than what we have here today, maybe a little bigger, possibly. Okay. A small community meant the Dianim are not remote figures. The guy lives next door to you. You see, in American law, in most countries, judge is remote on purpose, wears a black robe, sits in a high place, and probably doesn't live near where you live. So you're not going to run into him. And they want that for the majesty of the law. But what if the judge <laughs> sits next to my father and Shul, and he hits me with a fine for $10,000? The father's going to start arguing with him in Mincha. You see? They're your neighbors. The town may have a total of 20 families or less. Do you really think they're going to impose malchus on your son whipping and then sit down next to you and Shul? The Shal Shudas? Human relations aren't built that way. You understand? Um, in a Choshu Mishma case, can the judges decide totally in favor of one party and bankrupt the other if they all dominate the same Shul? and require each other all the time for business purposes anyway. All of a sudden in town, the 10 capitalists in town, well, let's say, for example, in the jewelry business, you know, for example, in the fur business, whatever, and, you know, something happens. We're going to give this guy Malchus, or we're going to, to be arguing between two merchants, Kaplan A and Kaplan B. You're going to file for Kaplan A. Really? You're going to bankrupt Kaplan B? And on the other hand, we need him in the community to be part of the operation business-wise and otherwise. So you're running always again and again and again tonight is there a difference between the letter of the law and life. Okay? Now, they're all from over here. Uh, again, are you going to bankrupt somebody when your kids all play together? Because these are the only Jewish kids in town. It's a sea of Catholics out there. So how can I, as a judge, impose a heavy penalty on you and you kids won't invite my kids to play with them? for the birthday party. And I'll tell you again, it's tough enough, even if the few kids here, even if the few kids here, you know, hang together. Because the whole world out there is not Jewish. And so how does that work? You see? The larger communities in Spain afforded a more austere and distant judiciary, but not in Ashkenaz. Don't be surprised if Ashkenazi Jews will be pressured to settle out of court, or perhaps to respected arbitrators. Some sort of a Zabla situation, usually in fatherly advice from the respected businessman. Now, I'll tell you something very interesting. In Spain, there was no Zablas. They didn't know what that is. There's a bait in, you gotta go there, and that's the end of it. You see? Now, you could, you know, I guess appoint an arbitration board, um, but usually wasn't done. And the idea of Zebra, this guy chooses one, they didn't know about it in Spain. And Ashkenaz is it every day. Or women. There are all these laws, and we'll talk about this next time, in the Talmudic law, which discriminate, especially financially or otherwise, against a married woman. That simply didn't mesh the reality of the very powerful, economically powerful women in Ashkenaz women in Spain and Western Germany, I've talked about before. 
let's put it this way, very often, in those communities, she wears the pants. Yes, then. He makes kiddish, but when, when she says, now, that really was life. They said, how are you going to administer all these laws and say, well, it's a woman and something like that? It doesn't match the social reality. You see? So the small size was as important was an important social historical factor in the development of the Ashkenaz Basin and their less formal character. Another difference between Ashkenaz and Sephardim in the first half of the Middle Ages, when Spain was under the Muslims, was the Gentile environment. Ashkenazi communities in northern France and western Germany were under constant hostile scrutiny and pressure from the Roman Catholic Church, which was not true in Spain. And I told you before, the Muslims consider anybody who's not Muslim be junk. But today, the Jews are better than the Christians. Because the Christians are always plotting to throw them out. And Jews aren't. And so if you're Jewish, the Islamic State was not against you. If your Islamic religious establishment was not against you. You understand? If you're living in France or Germany or Italy, the Catholic Church is against you. The Catholic Church was very hostile to the Jews. They viewed the deal that they made with the ten Kaplans, but the Evid, all right, the king needs money, uh, but why should we let these people who killed Christ, as they understand it, you know, live among us and have a synagogue and all that? It's just terrible. You understand? So these Jews lived in a much more hostile environment. Um, remember, I'm talking tonight about the first day of the Middle Ages, time of, of Dragma, Rabbeinu Gershon, Margol, Rashi, perhaps. The Catholic Church got even much worse in the second half of the Middle Ages. My point is that the small size itself lent itself to more informal arrangements regarding formal kahila structure, formal judicial structure. It was more patriarchal, like in the time of the Shoftim. It's probably hard to find non-relatives in these communities. You say, nobody can be a judge if he's not related. Everybody in the town's Kaplan. <laughs> right? The whole town of poop goes. They're all cousins. But, 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 you know, they, but they are. So who can be a Talmudic dying who's not related to any, you know. You see what I'm saying? This is what, again, the social reality is always so important in these areas. Um, I might also add that, see, I just say again, in Spain it wasn't like that. In Spain you had very formal structures, okay? I might add that there was a culture of veneration for predecessors set in quite early in Ashkenaz, and if that's the case, you know, this is what my bubby did, and my bubby's bubby, forget about it, she was a Siddiquist, so she made Shabbos at 72, don't anybody tell me it's not, you're not allowed, but she was a Siddiquist, she was a martyr in the Crusades, what are you going to say about her, get it, that kind of thing, and if she did 72, what are you going to say, so a culture of veneration set in very early, and therefore Minhag is super important in Ashkenaz, in a way, that wasn't the case in Spain, and an Ashkenaz Basin will enforce and punish for violation of these minhagim. At the same time, Ashkenazi yeshiva culture got really vibrant and intense. That's what made them Ashkenaz. The yeshiva culture, which is not judicial culture. In Spain, you have judicial culture in which people are training to be judges and always interested in what's the halacha lemaisa. In um, Ashkenaz, it's what we call lumdus. The people we want to say what's the Gemara mean and what's as far as behind its implications and so forth. This breeds intellectual boldness when it's a type of culture that encourages challenging the Magad Shir, which was not done in Spain. There's a famous story of, I always tell about Laser Gordon, the first, the founder of Tells. And, but it could go back a thousand years. And he was the Rav in the town, by the way, but he's also Rosh Shiva Tells. And all these smart guys. And when he would give a shear, a class, they would interrupt him. They banged their shoes on the table. They scream. He would scream back. They call each other names. They swore up their Russian shiva. They're stupid. No, you're stupid. <laughs> you know, things like that. Bist a pyre, a Turk, you know, a, a, a klutz cup, and so forth. And uh, a good time was had by all. And it's famous that a visiting rabbi came by. He said, I'm shocked. He rebuked the student body. He's talking to the head guy in such terms. This is outrageous. And he really ranked them out, and he made them rethink, and they decided they're going to show respect. 
It's funny, the next time he came, he opens the Gemara, he starts saying something, there's no response. It was another thing he does, there's no response. And he closed the Gemara, he's like, I don't give a shear in the cemetery. This type of culture that developed in Ashkenaz, which is at the same time big respect, at the same time you challenge. You understand? You challenge. If it's a good kasha, you challenge. This in, encouraged intellectual boldness, right? That's why we find, for example, Rashi's grandson arguing with Rashi. Um, this is the Rashbam, right? He said, Rashi, you're doing it all wrong. Your, your Chumash commentary is all wrong. Okay? Uh, My grandfather Rashi, uh, who wrote the commentary in the Bible, he tried to do Pshat. But I, his grandson, I forgot, I was 15 years old. This I argued with my grandfather. He said, You're not doing it right. And he agreed to me, if he has time, he'll rewrite the whole thing all with the new Shatim. Now, there's two ways, of course, of reading that story, right? Both of which are plausible. One is, Oh, your point is well taken. The other one is, Rashi well, was 60 years old. He's encouraging the great saints. Oh, you're right. <laughs> Ripper Stapper. Right. Which means he was a good educator. You see? But either way, I couldn't see the Rambam doing so to his father. Because my father was the son of the dying, he's the son of the dying, he's the son of the dying, and all the rest of it. And so the culture that emerges in these different Jewish communities is going to affect the conduct of how the laws are a rule. This kind of culture bred very self confident rabbis who were quite prepared to issue all kinds of laws even if they're living in the post Almudic era, which is very interesting. In other words, I told you, after the Talmud, there are no drabonans. No one can issue, under the Talmudic system, no one can issue new rulings for the Jewish people after the Talmud is over. There are no new drabonans, uh, which is interesting. Now, okay, in Ashkenaz they issued them, they, and they're followed locally. Okay? The two big names is Rabbeinu Gershom and Rashi, and Rabbeinu Tom, I mean. Rabbeinu Gershom, I think many people are familiar with. Rabbeinu Gershom lived in the late 900s, early 1000s. Ragma, they call him Rabbeinu Gershom Margola. He was a legislator for all of Talmud, all of Ashkenazi Jewry, even after the Talmud, which is interesting. In other words, let's put it this way. Who the heck gave you the right to say that polygamy is prohibited? Where do you get that from? They don't drop one anymore. According to the Talmud, you can have polygamy. How can you come across and tell you not allowed to do anymore? Why do I have to listen to you? You're one guy. In spite of what I said, it's not true. <laughs> they all listen. You see? That's what I mean. That's Ashkenaz. If he said it, they can live. So the harems of Rabbeinu Gershon, in which you can't have more than one wife, is very famous. You can't divorce a wife against her will, which is a big change under the Talmudic law. Uh, many other rulings, uh, most people are not familiar with the others, uh, are issued. And he says, we're doing, and believe you me, if it's an Ashkenazi based in, they will enforce that. If there's a guy committing bigamy in the 1100s, they'll unbigamy him real fast. You know what I'm saying? They'll take him real fast. Even though he might be able to say, I guess, what gives him the right to? No one would even have the chutzpah to talk like that. You see? Um, all the Ashkenazi courts came to follow his harems, especially on monogamy and non forced divorces. So imagine a lot of tiny communities with ad hoc courts scattered throughout France and Germany, all over the place, loyal to his harems. A century later, the big guy was Rabbeinu Tam, who was very wealthy, influential, and a powerful figure. He might even be the greatest of the Rishon. Here's a Sephardi who says that Rabbeinu Tam knocked them all out of the park. This is from the Rivosh. Uh, Rabbi Yaakov Tam, that's Rabbeinu Tam, Kamoba Pipolo Yehoya, Nobody was like him in learning ever since the time of the Gemara. Tom of Rabbi knew everything about heart, seen about Harim, but says about Pupula, Omic Sikhlarub, his IQ, his ability, analytical ability, is unbelievable. And he writes, Rabbeinu Tom is different because he was such a powerful figure, and he was like the Riff. He, he may have been bigger than the Riff, bigger than Rashi, bigger than Rabbeinu Khanano, and Harifas and Bakias, and so on and so forth. You know what I'm saying? And all the big rabbis today are nothing compared to him. So he attained this very powerful personal prestige. Okay? He was a millionaire too. Now, if Rajbam criticized his grandfather Rashi 
for his commentary on the Chumash, Rabbeinu Tom, as we all know, attacked Rashi mercilessly, with merciless logic, on every page of the Gemara. If you do your homework, and you do Gemara Rashi Tosis, Rashi made more mistakes than any rabbi that ever lived. Right? Because in every page of the Gemara, you have the Gemara, and then the commentary of Rashi, and then Tosis will tell you why Rashi is wrong. See? It's funny. Now, um, when I say merciless logic, I'm referring to Tosafistic dialectics, especially the idea of reading the Gemara in relationship to other parts of the Gemara, which Rashi didn't do. Now, that's a discussion by itself, and I don't want to go into the details of that now, but suffice it to say that there are very different readings by Rashi on the one hand of how Gemara is supposed to be understood and read versus Tosafist. Understand the significance of this. How can an Ashkenazic based in adjudicate Talmudic law if until Rabbeinu Tam everyone misunderstood how to read the Gemara? And that's the assertion of Rabbeinu Tam. So until now, until he analyzed the Gemara and came up with the Tosafistic interpretation, they're all getting it wrong because they didn't take into account all the other pieces or whatever it is. Right? So to simply say that Bezidans, even in the Middle Ages and Ashkaz, and taking the Gemara and applying it is stupid. So it's not surprising that someone who was such a takif ship at the Kifim, such a strong and powerful personality, should be acknowledged as El Supremo and should issue many of his own takonas, which were followed in Ashkenazi courts despite their post Talmudic dating. So we have a host of legislation which is now part of the court procedure, some Lakula and some Lakhura, issued by this very powerful guy named Rabbeinu Tan, who's alive now, it's in the 1100s. So what is the Talmudic law that you're adjudicating? Now, not all of his rulings were accepted. Um, the most famous one that I think of offhand is what they call Zirma Susim Zirmasan, in which he said that someone has a relationship with a non-Jew, it doesn't count, right? So a lady had an affair with somebody who wasn't Jewish, it's not adultery. Not adultery. And because of this, Ravain and Tom permitted a Jewish girl who converted to Catholic, ran off with her boyfriend, then she must have been some number. She decided to return to Judaism and she brought her French boyfriend with her to convert to Judaism. And he now wanted to convert and stay married to her. Theoretically, how can you stay married? You had an affair with this guy, a lady can't marry somebody she had, when she was married, she had an affair with someone else. And that was the case. And Rabbi Tom said, well, it doesn't count because he's not Jewish, so it's like a behemoth. You see, that was a radical ruling, because it's like a behemoth. Now that was too radical, they didn't accept that. That's a rare case. Usually if you had a ruling of Rabbi Tom, that's it, you see? And I don't doubt that there were probably plenty of French based in that used that. I'm just trying to show you how life was. As I said, as I come now to the end, Ashkenaz was in Christendom, so Jewish courts picked up a lot of the Christian norms of their courts, especially in the maiming. In Ashkenaz and early Middle Ages, they're really into chopping off hands, amputating this, that, and the other, all which is non-Talmudic. The main reason, the main case that they chopped off hands, it's funny, wife beating. You would guys three mornings. After that, is a chop off a head. Can't hit his wife anymore. On the other hand, <laughs> what kind of relationship is that? You know what I'm saying? In other words, Daddy, what happened to your hand? Well, ask your mother. You know. <laughs> yeah. But that's in, in, that's not a Jewish thing. There is a case like that anymore. It's not normative. But he said we'll do it. Okay. Um, in general, the Christian authorities were less willing to grant the Jews real punitive powers. And so the kind of powers that the Muslim state gave to the Jews, as we'll see even greater in the second half of the Middle Ages, was not common in the Christian area. Because it goes against the whole Paul, St. Paul, Pauline um, um, view of Judaism as something degraded. According to classic Catholic doctrine, the Jews killed Yashka. As a result of that, they lost their state. They lost their temple. They're downtrodden and degraded. They're, they're in exile and so forth. And that proves that we're right. So to the degree the Jews have a basin running, a kill running, frankly, if they see Jews employing Gentiles, which was always the case in the Middle Ages, there never was a Jewish family that was so poor that they couldn't hire some shiks to work for them. Because the Christians had groups that were much, much poorer. You see? It didn't exist. Every Jewish family had that. 
It's very offensive to their Catholic sensibility. Um, all this leads to consideration of the fact that due to the literary character of the Talmud, nearly all halacha turned out to be minhag, which is a very important point. But it's too late to go into that since the hour is late. And I'll play out more carefully next time. Let's leave this discussion for the next lecture and good night. We're done.